and we are now able to 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 have meetings in presence uh, so still i mean we go on the double uh, on the double uh, way on the double system so many many meetings uh, are are still on uh, virtual but also because you cannot tell the students uh, uh, that they have to be in presence uh, now you should yeah, tell them at the beginning of the year so that uh, so that they can rent a room uh, they didn't arrange themselves for so perhaps next year how about drinking party we are still prohibited to have a drinking party well so we I, am prohibit, I am prohibited perhaps but students uh, don't <laughs> okay okay <laughs> What about in Japan? Back to normal? No, 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 no. So they they still have a lot of the the restrictions. So they, for example, drinking party. We we don't have a big party. So next week, this is the end of the fiscal year in Japan. So we have a graduation yeah. ceremony next week. So mm -hmm. this year the the parents will not be invited. Only the student will get the diplomat okay. to reduce the. I see. Hi, the numbers in the US are numbers are very low now. So um, everything is back oh, to great. No. Yeah. Yeah. So how about so going, abroad? Are, going abroad? Going um, abroad, I think they I mean I went to India and came back. Nobody seemed to even care when yeah. we were coming in. So everything is uh, they were not strict to begin with, and uh, it's even easier now. Only thing okay. is that I hear if you want to get a visa to America, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it is almost, uh, at least in India, it, it's nine months. Okay. It, it just mm -hmm. backlog is enormous. Okay. I don't know uh, how about for you guys. Maybe you all have a 10 year visa or something like that. Uh, well, it's the same. I mean, I have two students and one went uh, as a postdoc to Yale and the other will go to Rochester and uh, they had to wait like seven months for their visa. So I had to, so it's, uh, it's a visa to US. So it's, um, I think more or less is, is the same. Yeah. You know, it's almost looks like it's by design. They, I mean, yeah. uh, if they want to do it, they could speed it up, but uh, there is no incentive. So they want to discourage it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Enrico. Enrico. Hello. Hey. Uh, Demir, hey. Enrico, please. <laughs> you guys interfere, so. Ciao. <laughs> Was it Patricia? We cannot see Enrico. I uh, also, Patricia? Yeah, Patricia, yeah. Enrico, I cannot see you. His video doesn't work. Okay, okay, his video is not About the visa situation you were saying, I think it has improved recently. Yeah. And now you can get visa in India in, within a couple of months or even one month. Where? I mean, I'm trying for my parents. Um, <laughs> not, not easy. They say next appointment is in November. Everywhere. Well, you can... I requested an emergency appointment and I got I think, with it. Uh, well, my parents are just coming for a visit. There is thankfully no emergency. <laughs> oh, so you, you have to wait for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, okay. I guess everything is emergency, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I think we so start in a minute. So you will mute all of us and remove. Uh, yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit everyone. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, please turn off your cameras.
大学。Okay, Vergis, uh, um, are you ready? Can we get started? You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes, I'm ready. Ciao, I, I, I'm gonna start. Um, welcome uh, uh, everyone uh, to our uh, IJMF uh, Spotlight uh, uh, Seminar. Um, uh, this is uh, our uh, um, fourth seminar for this uh, season um, and uh, the actual introduction of this uh, uh, today's uh, uh, presentation Good morning. Which, um, will be chaired by uh, 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 Professor Chao Sun um, from Tsinghua University. Uh, so I want to uh, take this opportunity to welcome everyone. Uh, and uh, please remember this uh, uh, seminar, Spotlight Seminar, is uh, uh, the first Tuesday and the third Tuesday of uh, every month. So a few more to follow. So we look forward to you joining uh, the future seminars as well. Uh, Chao, the um, floor is yours. OK. So so good morning, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So my name is Chao Sun from Tsinghua University. I will chair this talk. So first, uh, let me briefly introduce our speaker today. So Professor Vergis Matai, so faculty member in the Department of Physics at the University of Massachusetts. He completed his PhD in University of Twitter at the Netherlands in 2017, and did his postdoc- I cannot hear you. At the Brown University, where he worked on fluid structure interactions of bio-inspired material. His current group of research interests are mainly on the bubbly flow and particle laden flows and the flow structure interactions <coughs> of soft materials. Vergis's PhD work, in fact, was selected as the Da Vinci Award for top five PhD student thesis in Europe in the area of fluid mechanics, turbulence, and combustion. In 2008, he received the European Cost Prize for Best Research in flow, Flowing Matter. His recent research on COVID was featured in, no, uh, in New York Times and several other media. I have been collaborating with Vergis for more than uh, for nearly 10 years. He's a really a pleasant guy to, to be collaborated with. And he's really solid and he's extremely creative. I'm very much looking forward to Vergis' talk. Okay, now the floor is yours, Vergis. Well, thank you, Chao, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And I want to first start by thanking all the International Journal of Multiphase Flow organizers. Uh, I will continue thanking them through my slides, so I will not uh, uh, take too much time in, in starting my slides. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, can you can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Uh, and am I audible? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you again for this introduction, and uh, it's really an honor to give this seminar uh, for I IJMF Spotlight. And uh, I've I've watched several of these uh, spot Spotlight seminars in the past, and I'm 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 very very much uh, excited to uh, share some of the research that we've been doing in our group. Uh, so before I start, uh, Chow did introduce that uh, some of our research is on uh, bubbly and particle laden flows. I will not do justice to this today because I, my talk is mostly going to be about something slightly different from bubbly flows, which uh, uh, we are still interested in. But uh, for, for those who, who actually do hope that I we, we, to hear a little bit about these bubbly 
turbulent flows. I will uh, give an introduction on this and some of the problems that uh, still keep us very much engaged. Uh, so before much time, I will uh, start with some of the research themes that we have in our group. So these extend from bubbly turbulent flows. Some of the videos that you see on the left side are of micro bubbles or millimetric size bubbles. Uh, when they are very tiny, they are not deformable. And when they become uh, moderately sized, they, they start uh, deforming in the flow. And in the past, you've probably seen uh, Detlef Flosses uh, presentation where you see that these deformable elements make a number of changes to the, uh, to the flow properties. Uh, in our group, we also look at uh, other kinds of particles which are essentially rigid, uh, but which also have some property common to these bubbles, essentially that they are buoyant. And uh, we usually design these kind of particles to change the properties of the turbulence. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes it's very we clear. can hear it. It's very okay, clear. Okay. Right. So what you see here is, uh, is a collection of uh, particles which are chiral or which have some kind of... Uh, directionality that is uh, uh, printed into them. These are 3D printed particles, millimetric size, which are rising through a turbulent flow. And as you can imagine, because of their rotation, they will uh, perturb the, 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 the flow around them in, in such a way that you get a vorticity in, in a direction that you, you prefer to have. Uh, so some of this work is actually covered in, uh, in our review article, which is co-authored with Detlef and Chao. So, I mean, since I will not talk anything about this, I welcome all of you to have a look at this. Uh, this is a pretty recent review. It was uh, published in uh, 2020. And before I uh, move on from this review, I want to also thank some of the IJMF organizers, the editors and such, uh, in particular uh, Bala for his uh, very impactful and outstanding review, which really inspired some of us to continue this research and the other uh, IJMF uh, uh, chief editor who's uh, Alfredo, who, who, who has also written this uh, wonderful review on particles in turbulence. So these, these have really been um, in, inspirational in, 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 in many of our directions. So I, I, I want to start by uh, thanking them for, for these wonderful uh, educational pedagogical review articles that they wrote. OK, so our interest is also extending into many other kinds of uh, bubbly flows. So I want to quickly show you uh, uh, some of the topics that we have worked on in the past. Uh, mainly adding bubbles to a turbulent flow and changing the energy spectrum that's present in the flow, and also adding these kind of millimetric bubbles and trying to change the mixing that's present in the flow. So, I mean, it's it's not new to the IGMF audience that if you add millimetric bubbles which rise through the flow, you can create vigorous mixing in the flow. So we have been interested in this. Uh, and recently with Chao, we also had some work which looked at uh, these kind of bubbles, but essentially when they are vapor phase bubbles, and a combination of liquid and vapor uh, phase. And in that situation, you get uh, vigorous activity uh, because of these bubbles. And these active bubbles essentially enhance the heat transfer. Uh, so these are some of the topics that we continue to work on. I will not go further into it. But uh, uh, when we talk about vapor bubbles, one person who comes to our mind is uh, uh, Andrea Prosperity. So I also want to thank him for the many interactions that we've had in the past. Uh, that's not about it. Uh, some of the topics that we are currently working on are also very much relatable or inspired by some of the editors or uh, editorial board members of IGMF. So in this case, I'm showing one of the current projects that we are working on in our group. This is a very simple uh, classical problem that we all are aware of. It's a, it's a liquid jet that's impacting on a pool uh, and it's creating these bubbles. So it has been widely studied in the nature of the jet, how it penetrates, how the underwater multi-phase flow develops. But what we have been looking at recently is what is the surface distribution of these bubbles and whether we can understand how, what is the uh, radial distribution, the surface statistics, and also the collective dynamics of some of these elements. So I want to show you a video of what happens uh, to these bubbles if you track them uh, in 2D. Uh, I don't know if the video is play playing properly, but you can see these uh, swarm-like behaviors which are very interesting and uh, also very complex uh, because this is a poly dispersed collection of uh, entities which are driven by capillary interactions and also driven by uh, the background turbulence or the advective flow field. And uh, I got into this problem uh, because I read one of the articles from Roberto Zenit, so which, which really inspired me. Uh, apparently it's about uh, mezcal and alcoholic drink in Mexico and uh, 
the number of bubbles that form on the surface is very much linked to uh, how fast this jet falls and what are the some of the dimensionless numbers. So that has motivated us to look into this, and this is really an ongoing direction in my group. Uh, so without much uh, uh, taking much more time, I want to move on to some other directions which the bubbly flows and particulate flows have driven us into in the recent years. So this is not something that I need to motivate people about. Uh, with the uh, since the pandemic has started, we we are all uh, very much concerned about how airborne transmission occurs. So this has also been one of the directions in our group, and specifically one problem that I want to show you that is of also of relevance in multiphase clouds is when you're standing in a waiting line. Uh, this is also a very crucial problem because we are usually told to stand with a physical separation of six feet. And what we are uh, recently trying to show is that uh, this physical separation it, it itself is not really a relevant parameter. So what I show in a quick video below is a cloud of uh, uh, a proxy cloud of uh, uh, particles which are released by a person and then it's uh, it's essentially being transported to the person behind uh, in a waiting line uh, and uh, you can see that most of this uh, breathed out cloud is actually right in front of the person behind so if if you what I, what i want to start with is that uh, if, if if we are engaged in the multi-phase flow community uh, some of these uh, problems are very much relatable and when uh, serious situations that require us to contribute arise, we can all uh, put our skills to uh, to play. Uh, so without uh, going much into this, I want to now start what is the outline of today's uh, talk. Uh, I've spent 10 minutes, so if I'm going uh, over time, uh, Chao, please do let me know. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, soft materials and turbulent flows. And this might look very different from uh, the typical multi-phase flow systems that we are uh, uh, interested in in our group, but I will try to convince uh, uh, at least uh, some of you that uh, these systems are very similar. Uh, so first part, I will I will talk about uh, uh, something which looks at drag modulation because of the presence of soft materials in turbulent flows. And then the second part, I'll try to focus on how the same kind of soft materials can be used for another kind of engineering benefit, which relates to energy extraction from a flow. Okay, so let's start with what we mean by the soft materials. So I'd like to turn your attention to one of the familiar jello, which which all of us are familiar with. It's soft, it's deformable, and it will probably deform under gravity itself. So if you look at jello, it's a shear modulus or or the resistance to uh, shear forces is basically around 100 to uh, it's, it's around a few hundreds. So these kind of soft materials that we are talking about, we will vary its properties uh, um, in the sense the shear modulus uh, by nearly two orders of magnitude. So they are tunable soft materials. And then we combine these kind of soft solids with uh, a, a high Reynolds number turbulence. And the question we ask is how do the uh, shape changes or deformabilities of these kind of soft materials affect uh, the flow properties as a whole or whether we can create new uh, emergent flow properties because of the presence of these soft materials. So here is, a, I'm, I'm just trying to show the distinction. We have a solid, a rigid solid, we have liquid, and then something in between is this soft solid. Uh, so on the, on the picture on the right side, the shear model is around 100 pascals, and then you can already see that it's actually uh, deforming under gravity, and also it's it's got some wetting properties very close to the surface. Okay, so uh, we started looking at this. So our interest was primarily to start with something we all are very familiar with. So if you want to look at uh, the simplest of a fluid mechanical problem, uh, you would think of a bluff body, uh, which is subjected to a uniform flow. And uh, uh, this is a very well studied problem. If you have a circular disc uh, onto which you have a uniform stream and what happens to the, uh, the, the flow upstream of it and the flow downstream of it. So this is really well studied. So if you if you look at literature, I'm, I'm quoting one of the um, recent studies which looked at this using uh, numerical simulations. And what you see in this kind of a flow is that you have nearly irrotational flows. So the colors are showing here are the vorticity in the um, transverse direction of the flow. And what you see upstream is that it's uh, 
uh, nearly rotational and downstream you, you get this wake and this is very much expected if you have a uniform stream turning around and you have sharp edge of the circular disk and you get uh, flow separation and then uh, creation of vorticity and you can probably guess that the wake is actually turbulent and uh, this is corresponding to a Reynolds number of around 10, 10 raised to 5. So what we do to this system is to replace this kind of a circular disk with a, a circular ring, but inside the ring you have a very soft material. So it's not enough to uh, define it as soft. It, we should also mention that it's soft, it's ultra soft, and it's also very thin. And then the question we ask is, what kind of uh, behavior does this material uh, produce as a result of its interaction with the flow? So it's not in the domain of the conventional fluid structure interactions, but it's essentially you have to say that these the, these are highly deformable materials. So they are uh, they, they they fall into the category of soft fluid structure interactions. We can make like I said, we can make them with very different properties. So you can vary uh, the shear modulus of these materials from around 0.2 kilopascals to 20 kilopascals, which is two orders of magnitude. And like I said. Uh, these materials are very thin. So its thickness compared to the diameter uh, of the circular disk is uh, around um, uh, 1,000. So this is around 100 microns in, uh, in thickness, and it's around uh, 100 millimeters in uh, diameter. So you can think of these as very thin uh, materials. And then uh, I'll try to show what happens when you when you subject it to a flow. So you can imagine that these materials are subjected to a uh, aerodynamic uh, pressure acting on it. And if you increase the flow speed, you get these kind of deformation patterns. All of these actually start with a flat circular disk, uh, but when you increase the, 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 the flow speed, you, you deform them into shapes. Now, the question that's of interest to us first is, uh, what are these shapes like uh, in the presence of a high Reynolds number flow? And uh, what are the forces that uh, act on this uh, body as a result of the uh, slowing down of the incoming flow. Uh, so before I go into that, this is, I'm sure many of you might uh, uh, recollect that this is quite similar to the creation of a, a soap bubble or so. Uh, you blow into it and then you deform it and then you, uh, you pinch it off. Of course, in this case, we do not have the pinch off uh, process, but uh, in many ways, it's very similar. So if you were to look at um, the forces acting on this uh, interface of this soft material, that those are also very similar. You do have to make one assumption, uh, of course, that uh, the bending rigidity of this material is very small. And that uh, assumption is pretty reasonable if you have materials which are very thin. So basically you can write a dimensionless number called the von Kármán number, which uh, is very small in this case because the thickness is much smaller than the, um, than the uh, length or the diameter of the material. So if you actually forget about the bending cost of this material, then the resulting equation that you get, at least in the steady state, is almost identical to what you have for a, for a gas bubble. And so if you know that, you can say that the tension in the material uh, times the curvature of this uh, uh, ballooning material is, is, is equal to the pressure difference between the front side and the back side. Now, the, uh, you can see that I've written the curvature as a function of the uh, radius of this uh, of this uh, uh, domain, and I've also written the pressure as a function of the radius. But if you look uh, uh, into literature, very well studied problems of flow past a disk, you can already tell a lot about what this pressure distribution and what this curvature would look like. So this is again from uh, one of the papers, which shows that uh, which shows that uh, the upstream pressure is uh, something like this. It's the pressure coefficient, and the downstream pressure is almost a constant. That means you can, to some reasonable approximation, make uh, the claim that the pressure is not dependent on the radial distance. So you have a nearly uniform pressure upstream and you have a nearly uniform pressure downstream. And that reduces our equation, the steady state equation to the curvature is simply a, a constant pressure by the tension that's developed in this material. So that's very familiar to us. It's like the young Laplace equation for a bubble. And let's start with that now. So it looks almost identical. So these materials are as seemingly as simple as a bubble uh, under this, this set of uh, boundary conditions. Uh, and you have the curvature, uh, which depends on the pressure and the tension that's uh, developed in this material. So one 
at the same time, one major difference between these soft materials and uh, a soap film or an oil film uh, bubble is that uh, it's got a tension which is not uh, at all a constant. So if you were to plot the stress that's developed in a uh, stretching material versus strain, then it's very nonlinear. And uh, I give you an example of uh, three different shear moduli and how the stress strain curve of these hyperelastic uh, materials are like. So what you can see is that uh, it's uh, it's got a very steep increase and then it uh, somewhat plateaus and then it again starts to stiffen. So these are linked to the presence of polymers, polymer chains inside these materials. And so beyond the value of strain, they start to become uh, stiffening. Uh, if you were to compare what a liquid film or a soap film would be, it would have a constant tension or a constant stress irrespective of what its uh, strain is. So if you rewrite this young Laplace equation with a strain dependent tension, that does part of the job. At the same time, there's one more difference is that at zero strain, these materials have almost zero stress, which means that it doesn't have some constant surface tension or interfacial tension as would a soap bubble or a liquid bubble have. So that we can actually uh, artificially create if you were to uh, do some kind of a initial pre-stretching operation to this material. So that's what you see in this experiment. You, you basically have this uh, soft uh, ring uh, circular material that's equibiaxially stretched in all directions. So it acquires some kind of a constant pre-stretch uh, tension value. So with that, you can actually offset these curves and then at least it starts off just like a soap uh, bubble. Okay, so then you have this young Laplace equation, you, which you can non-dimensionalize. Uh, and when you non-dimensionalize, you get uh, uh, in the steady state, you get one uh, dimensionless number, which is the called the arrow elastic number, which simply represents the ratio of the elastic properties of this elastic uh, forces developed in this material to the hydrodynamic or aerodynamic forces. Okay, so for knowing this single number and knowing what's the pressure distribution, uh, you can actually solve this problem. And uh, like I said, because the pressure distribution is nearly uniform, the only solution that you can get from this is, uh, is that of a spherical cap. Now, if you know that the shape of this material is a spherical cap, then you also know you, you need only know the maximum deflection in this material. So you can make a very nice prediction for what the maximum deflection of these uh, soft materials should be when they are subjected to this kind of a ballooning pressure. So that's our theoretical prediction. And if you put in uh, experimental data points, they pretty much very nicely collapse onto this. So it's essentially a situation of a soft bubble, which has its own uh, strain dependent uh, surface tension. You could think of it like that. And uh, uh, that looks pretty simple. And uh, we, we know how what the shape of this material is. Uh, we can also draw a relation between the pressure and the strain uh, using the same uh, young Laplace equation and then come to a prediction for what the dynamic pressure should be in order to achieve a particular kind of stretch for this material. Uh, all of this uh, uh, is under the assumption that it still maintains a spherical cap shape, just like a bubble would. Okay, so that's not just about it. We, we should also look a little bit into what are the forces that act on this material. So we also mounted a force sensor behind these uh, uh, ballooning disks, and we try to see what are the time uh, varying forces on this. So first I'm showing you the force fluctuations. Again, all of these forces are normalized with the dynamic pressure that's uh, acting on the, on, on, on the, on the disk uh, based on its uh, cross-sectional area. And you can see these, uh, these force forces are actually uh, they're subjected to very intense fluctuations. If you take the power spectrum of these fluctuations, again, normalized with the uh, uh, dynamic pressure square, you'd see that there is a peak which corresponds to a particular frequency. And if you were to write it in, in, in again in non-dimensional non form, you'd see that this is nothing but the shedding frequency behind this bluff body. So it corresponds to around 0.12 uh, Strohal number. Okay, and uh, we see that the this frequency of shedding is actually the same for the uh, rigid object, which is similarly shaped as this soft membrane. Uh, and also for the soft membrane. I'll get into more details of this uh, later, but let's move on with that. 
So we then look into what is the drag coefficient. So we do see that these materials actually deform, uh, these membranes deform into spherical cap shapes. So uh, if one were to do a simple control volume analysis, you in, in the steady state, you would see that uh, its drag coefficient should also be comparable to that of rigid objects. And we know that if, uh, if you have a rigid object from Horner's uh, very early work, that if, uh, if, if you have rigid cup shapes, which have different uh, deformations or, or, or which have different kind of uh, curvature, you start to increase the drag that these shapes experience. So obviously uh, here you already have a situation where you have these soft uh, deformable materials which change its own drag because of shape morphing, that, that much can be expected. So we also do this kind of measurement for these membranes. Now, when we do these kind of measurements for the membranes, we see that something which starts off at a drag coefficient of 1.2 when it was a circular disc has finally ended up with a drag coefficient of around 1.6. So that's around 50% increase. I've got the number wrong here, but if you start from here, you'd see about 50% increase, up to 50% increase in the uh, drag forces that this soft material experiences as compared to a similarly shaped rigid uh, cup shape, shape body. Now that makes us think what is causing this. So you need to look at one of these extremes cases and that's the red point I show here. And on the right side, I'm showing a video of what happens to this material. So its mean shape is nearly identical. We have checked that it's nearly identical to that of a uh, spherical uh, cap or in this case, a hemispherical cap. Uh, but if you look very closely, you'd start to see some small oscillations on this. If you actually measure these oscillations, they are about 1% of the diameter. So that's why it's not so easy to uh, see them. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's very clear. Right. right. So you can see these very tiny oscillations. And then naturally, the question that we ask is, what, what is the role of these uh, oscillations? So for simplicity, we can actually start with this uh, deformed orientation, the deformed configuration, which, which uh, we can already predict uh, with, our, with a simple young Laplace kind of model. And then we can look at what happens to uh, this membrane as a result of these unsteady forcing that we already saw in the force measurements. So in that form, you can actually rewrite this young Laplace. So these, the two terms that you see here is exactly the tension in the material non-dimensional times the curvature is balanced by the pressure that's acting on two sides of this uh, membrane. And then there is an additional term which comes due to the acceleration of this, this interface. So the acceleration of the interface, because the interface has a density, as a material density, it would have a mass also coming into this. So that's our balance equation. The only difference we have from the previous young Laplace, Laplace we saw is that now the uh, deformations are actually defined based on the mean curved shape. So you can actually linearize it and uh, solve this much easier than uh, you could solve in the full um, uh, uh, large deformation limit. Okay, so what does this uh, essentially show? Just like any uh, dynamical equation, you have an acceleration term, which depends on its mass of this membrane. You have a, uh, um, um, a resisting force to deformation, and then you have an external force. And for this external force, in this case, since we know that there is vortex shedding happening in the wake of this body, you can already put in some kind of a forcing frequency to this. So this pressure coefficient in this case, can be approximated as some kind of a force times a uh, sinusoidal function, which has a frequency comparable to the vortex shedding frequency. If you do that, uh, this equation actually, again, has some similarities to our familiar Rayleigh Plasset equation, except that you have this mass of the membrane, which is additionally coming into it. So again, I'm trying to show analogies to, or, or, or similarities to what we already know in terms of bubble dynamics and such, but here using, uh, uh, elasticity problem with uh, interaction with fluids. Okay, so now let's go to this uh, uh, equation, which uh, has, when you write it in non-dimensional form, you have a second dimensionless parameter, which is called the mass ratio. And you have the aeroelastic elastic number, just like we defined it. And you have a pressure uh, coefficient, which we have to um, uh, put in a value for. When you look at uh, uh, the response of this material uh, for different mass ratios, you'd see that at a particular mass ratio, you see very large uh, oscillations. And then uh, for lower mass ratios and for larger mass ratios, it actually damps down. 
if you were to solve this uh, equation uh, with or without damping, you would see that this uh, optimal mass ratio is almost a perfectly predicted by this uh, uh, simple one-dimensional model. And what you see here is essentially resonance. So to understand that, you can actually look at the relation between what is the natural frequency of a stretched membrane or a stretched uh, thin elastic material. And that does have uh, elements of the aeroelastic number and the mass ratio. So if you were to increase the mass of this membrane, obviously uh, it's, it's like a spring constant over mass of the material. So you can tune its natural frequency. And this kind of uh, peak oscillations do occur when you have resonance. That is to say that when you have the wake of this um, um, uh, of this bluff body exerting these vortex induced forces, when that frequency actually matches exactly with the, uh, with the natural frequency of this membrane. So you can actually derive this and uh, get to a relation that uh, the ratio of the natural frequencies is simply uh, square root of the uh, mass ratio of this membrane. So basically we can make these membranes a little bit th thicker or thinner and change its uh, resonant frequency and tune it to our uh, experimental setting and uh, lead to these kind of uh, oscillations in this material. Okay, so now if we look into these uh, amplitude of these oscillations, they are still very, very small. So if you look at some of these oscillations, they are like a few percents of the diameter. So even though you have resonance, they are getting, the oscillations are getting damped and you do not uh, get any, any kind of vigorous vibrations. But if you revisit uh, the, the drag coefficient, you do see that there is about 50% increase in the drag coefficient. So what is uh, basically causing this kind of an increase in this uh, drag coefficient? So that's our next question. So before that, we'd, I'd like to uh, point a little bit into what is the mean drag and what is the mean drag fluctuations also these materials exhibit. So maybe I should go a few slides back to show you the amplitude of the power spectrum of the uh, force fluctuations. And you can see that a rigid object has uh, a value which is six power 10 power minus nine, while a membrane has nearly four orders of magnitude higher than this. So that already tells you that there are intense force fluctuations, which these membranes are subjected to, even though you see that their oscillations are pretty um, uh, minor, at least visually they look uh, pretty minor. So we want to look into how these, what, what causes these force fluctuations. So we make an assumption that these are very thin materials and they're undergoing these oscillations. So you can simply write down what is the inertial force due to their acceleration itself. So if you write that down, you can uh, essentially say that the force kinematic scaling would give you uh, the force fluctuations is simply uh, an effective mass of this material times the oscillation frequency, which is always uh, happening at the resonant frequency. So you know that from the Schohal number and also the amplitude of these fluctuations, which we just predicted using the uh, damped oscillator model. If you plug these numbers in, you'll get a force fluctuation coefficient, which depends on the Schohal number, the mass ratio and the amplitude of these fluctuations. And what I'm showing here is the amplitude of these fluctuations uh, that is measured using the force sensor against this simple uh, prediction. Note that we have not used any uh, fitting parameters into this, and it's almost two orders of magnitude variation in these fluctuations. So when you put this in, we see that it's pretty much on dot. Um, what it shows is that these fluctuations are actually still maintaining more or less the axisymmetry of these oscillations so that you do not need uh, any extra fitting parameters to uh, predict these fluctuations. Okay, so that essentially means that these fluctuations that these membranes are subjected to are purely inertial. That is that it's, it's coming from the movements of these membranes and not due to the, 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 the forces that the uh, fluid uh, itself exerts. So now let's uh, again revisit this drag increase. Uh, so you do see that the drag fluctuations increase tremendously, uh, but the drag fluctuations alone cannot explain why the mean drag of these materials are significantly higher. So here are the two extreme cases. The black curve is for a rigid hemispherical or a spherical cap kind of shape. And the uh, purple colored uh, data points are for a membrane, which is uh, having the same shape as the rigid object, but uh, 
significantly higher drag. So at all values of deformation, you see that it's all more or less like an offset to this drag coefficient. So we want to see what's actually causing this uh, drag increase, even though these fluctuations that you see of the membrane itself are very tiny. So naturally, if you're an experimental fluid dynamicist, you look into what happens to the flow field around it. So, I mean, that's also what we did uh, with uh, our collaborators, uh, Asiman Shudas, and this was done in Kenny Broyer's group. So we had this wind tunnel into which we placed this membrane and we looked at what is the um, you know, wake behind the, the this membrane. And again, uh, so we had some kind of uh, arrangement so that um, a laser sheet could be passed uh, at the um, uh, mid uh, section of this membrane and you can see the, what is the mean wake under the assumption of axis symmetry. And then if you know what is the mean wake structure, you can also make some predictions of what the drag on these materials would be. So the drag has essentially two components, you could say. Uh, one is coming due to the uh, velocity deficit of the incoming stream, and the other that's coming due to the velocity fluctuations. So those are the two terms I've written here. I'll go a little bit into the details of this, but uh, I want to show you first what the mean uh, wake velocity looks like. On the left side is a rigid hemispherical shape. And you can see this is the mean axial uh, of the stream-wise velocity field uh, at mid uh, section of this. And it's an almost identically shaped membrane uh, hemisphere. And in this case, you see an almost identical mean velocity field. Uh, we also look into the turbulence and there you start seeing the differences because of the presence of this membrane. So you see that in the case of a rigid object, the wake is, uh, has turbulence, but the turbulent kinetic energy is significantly lower than that of a membrane. This is pretty interesting to note because if you were to compare the energy density of these membranes themselves fluctuating, it's only around um, one or two percent of the turbulence amplification that you get in the wake. So basically, if you look at the profiles at, uh, say, a distance of a few diameters downstream of the membrane, you'd see that the mean wake profiles are almost identical uh, for the membrane and the rigid shape, but the turbulent kinetic energy is significantly enhanced. Uh, so if you were to compare the amp magnitude of this, uh, which is for the rigid shape and this for the membrane, you'll see that you get around 80% increase in the uh, turbulent kinetic energy in the wake. And uh, so if you look at the drag coefficient based on the wake momentum analysis, you'd see that the mean uh, velocity profile or the mean uh, momentum deficit is nearly identical, but the turbulence contribution is significant. And we were able to get uh, some kind of an agreement to uh, what the drag coefficient should be because of this. Okay, so that's the mechanism. And now what might be some of the implications of what we saw here? So it's very well known that if you have a, uh, a deformed cup-shaped object, which it looks very similar to what a parachute is. And in these high Reynolds number settings, we all know that the drag coefficient should scale with, uh, or the forces on, on the object should scale with velocity square. Uh, so that means that if you have a, uh, a, a nylon or some, uh, or a inextensible material shaped parachute which is having a uh, which is uh, settling you'd see that the payload would uh, go with the square of the velocity uh, instead if you have a membrane which actually can uh, uh, show some of these shape morphing capabilities you'd see that it would have a much uh, 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 steeper velocity dependence that means that uh, if you actually have a payload variation, which is larger, you still can get uh, a velocity of a terminal velocity or a safe landing velocity to be much narrower. So this is what I show here. If you essentially use a material which is deforming and changing its track coefficient as it falls, the sensitivity to changes in the payload of this object is, is reduced. So that means that if you have a weight which is around 30 kilograms, I've used some arbitrary numbers for arriving at this, but if you have a payload of 30 kilograms uh, or a payload of around 45 kilograms, the change in the settling speed is not as significant as you'd get for a rigid object. So this might point to some potential applications of these uh, uh, membranous materials. Of course, we are not uh, focusing on many of the important uh, other considerations that come into this, but at a fundamental level, this does show that you can use a shape morphing uh, material to cause a new kind of an emergent drag behavior. 
So with that, I would like to stop on this aerodynamics of these soft materials, but uh, use some of these insights that we've already gained into a hydrodynamic setting. Again, I did say that we can tune the properties of these materials significantly. That means that we can adapt uh, these uh, soft deforming materials to hydrodynamic settings. So what we have here is a slightly different kind of application which relates to energy extraction. Uh, that means that uh, we want to look a little bit into some sources of energy which are currently not so well uh, explored. And one of them is uh, that of tidal energy resource. And there are reasons why it's not currently explored in, in great, uh, to a great extent. If you look at this plan, uh, at this map of the uh, mean tidal uh, daily range, what you'd see is also the depth of this um, uh, tidal energy resources. So you can see that it's it's not uh, sign it's not available at significant depths. These are something like uh, uh, 2.4 meters or so. So these are very shallow resources, and it's not always practical to install rotary turbines in these settings. So the norm or the one of the alternatives that is proposed is that you can use flapping foils to extract energy out of this. Now let's look a little bit into flapping foils. So these are an unsteady uh, kind of energy extraction uh, device. That means that it has potential to give you very high efficiencies, uh, higher than what you'd get from a BETS limit or a steady flow kind of limit. So let's look a little bit into how these uh, unsteady flapping foil technologies work. Uh, so instead of a rotary turbine collection, you can replace them with oscillating heaving and pitching foils. And what you see on the right side is one of these oscillating heaving pitching foils. So it does operate currently, if you, if you see this motion, it is actually operating in an energy extraction mode. Uh, you can tell that if you look at the forces that uh, are acting on this object. So essentially the forces are always in the direction in which it's moving. So you get positive power output from this. So the benefits of this technology are many. You do get low tip speed, you have uh, the, the, the opportunity to install them in shallow water uh, settings, and it's also easy to scale up. Uh, and this is pretty well established, but there are also some challenges to this technology. One thing that you would notice in this uh, heaving and pitching oscillations is that the foil that you use is symmetric. Uh, it's not just um, a non-cambered uh, uh, hydrofoil cross-section, but it's also left-right symmetric. This is because if you were to install it in a tidal setting, you have uh, uh, the, the uh, upcoming tide and also the receding tide. So this same device needs to work for both of these settings. So you, you, you are constrained to have this shape to be um, um, symmetric in, in all respects. Okay, that, that's one of the things. So we all know that if you were to utilize camber or, uh, um, um, or, or better uh, profiles for airfoils, it, it can certainly benefit. So some of you might already have guessed what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at this uh, using a soft material. Uh, only thing is that I'm going to use it as a foil instead of a uh, deforming cup. Uh, so uh, here is a, a two-dimensional picture of what this foil looks like if you were to subject it to a uniform flow. It's almost identical to the circular disk except that you have an angle of attack here and it's, it's uh, essentially two-dimensional. And the same dimensional number comes into play here, which is the aeroelastic number. And if you were to map out how this kind of a soft material responds to the flow, uh, basically in terms of the lift coefficient versus the different angles of attack and for different values of aeroelastic number, this is the full map you get. And what's interesting to note is that the peak lift coefficients that you get are around three to four. Uh, if you're not that familiar with this, um, uh, these values, I'd like to show you a comparison which is shown based on a cross section that's taken here. You see that the, uh, the, uh, that the, 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 the lift versus angle of attack curve for a rigid plate is significantly shallower. Not only that, you see that even at small angles of attack, these membranes actually give a finite lift. That means that you can operate these membranes at very sh shallow angles of attack. Uh, which means that you do not need to uh, subject it to very large rotations if you are making a design. So that's just about the static lift. We can also look at some other feature of these materials, which is to look at uh, the unsteady uh, lift of these uh, membranes. And one of the important 
features of the soft wings is that uh, uh, they actually allow you to uh, attach the leading edge vortex for significantly longer duration. So this is a picture of uh, an example of what a leading edge vortex might look like. And it really results in a lower pressure uh, on one side of the foil as compared to the other. So these two aspects or these two benefits of uh, uh, soft materials we're going to use or make use of in this. And I'm just showing here a schematic of how this membrane responds to these uh, oscillating motions. So it's just uh, like an artist impression of what it looks like. And we do a number of measurements, some of which are similar to what you saw in the first part of my talk. Uh, we measure the unsteady deformations, we measure the forces acting on it, and we also look at the wake vorticity. Okay, so uh, first I want to show you how this material uh, basically deforms as you un undergo this kind of heaving and pitching motion. Uh, it's slowed down six times, so the actual motion is much faster. And you can see that each time it flips its orientation, it has reoriented itself into a cambered configuration. And what you see here is basically uh, uh, with the, the frame of reference of the leading edge and the trailing edge, how the deformations change. Now, you already can imagine that this kind of a uh, cambered shape will have uh, higher lift forces due to the same uh, young Laplace kind of uh, model that we discussed. And in addition to that, you'll also see that the leading edge vortex that's developing on these membranes stay attached for significant duration. So if you're not able to see it through the PIV field of the vorticity, I'm showing you three uh, successive snapshots which show that this kind of a vortex is actually staying attached. And this profile, what I'm showing is roughly the shape of the membrane. And so you have these two effects combining and leading to an increased lift on these materials. I, without uh, spending too much more time, I want to convince you that these materials actually uh, behave almost exactly like this uh, uh, gas bubble. You can use the same membrane structural equation, which is modeled on the young Laplace kind of equation and uh, predict what kind of deformations they undergo. And you can also uh, see that uh, the power coefficient that you get for this. So here I'm basically showing you two cases. The top one is the lift curve for a rigid plate and the bottom one is that for a membrane. And uh, uh, these are showing you the, the, the vertical structures that are uh, generated by the membrane and these for the rigid plate. So what is interesting to note is that for the rigid plate, after a while, the lift coefficient actually drops significantly uh, compared to the membrane. And at this point, you see, if you see the wake behind it, you see that the leading edge vortex has this detached and you have counter rotating vorticity in the, uh, on top of the uh, foil. But in the membrane, you still have the uh, leading edge vortex more or less attached. And because of that, you, you sustain this uh, high lift value throughout this unsteady oscillation. Now, all that translates to a higher lift force. And if you get a higher lift force, you'll also imagine a better power performance, assuming the motion is identical. So that's what's shown here. It's the power coefficient for different pitch angles that you provide for this heaving and pitching motion. And what you see in the black is the rigid uh, foil where the power coefficient is between 10 to 20%. Uh, and for the membrane, you see that again, there is a kind of an offset. So in some ways you can actually see the two stories and say that uh, in the first story, you had a drag coefficient, which is offset uh, for these membranes, which was which can potentially have some applications. And in this case, you have the power coefficient, which is also offset by using these membranes. So with that, I'd like to uh, conclude and uh, thank you all for this attention. Uh, this work was basically done in collaboration with Asiman Shudas, uh, Gali Sesana and Kenny Goyer at Brown University. And in addition to that, I'd like to thank a lot of people who have really been instrumental and uh, inspirational in some of these uh, bubbly turbulent flows that we are exploring and some of these uh, insights into ultra soft materials and how they respond to uh, turbulent flows. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vakis, for the brilliant talk. So it's, it's, it's a the talk was a beautiful. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Okay. Now the floor is open for questions. So basically you can unmute yourself to ask questions. Um, hi, uh, I have a quick question. Very nice talk. Um, my question is regarding the, the first half of the presentation. So you said 
you showed that we you see a increase in turbulent kinetic energy from um, a, a membrane, right? Do, do you think the this increase in TKE is result of the membrane vibration? And if so, have you tried to check the power spectrum of the of the wake? And is there like a, a spike in in the in, in the wave number at which the the vibration um, height corresponds to? Right. So to answer your question, I don't have a full answer for this, uh, but um, uh, it certainly has a link to the oscillations of the membrane. Uh, only when you get oscillations of the membrane do you see these uh, these intense vibrations. For instance, if I were to Can you see my slide? Yes. Yes. Right. So if I were to color these, so I did not show it in with uh, colored with the thickness, but these are essentially the mass ratios. So if you go off this resonance point, then you'll start uh, getting these membranes having a drag coefficient, which is almost uh, identical to that of a rigid shape. So it's certainly linked to these vibrations. What is what 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 we are not able to fully understand is why these very small vibrations of the membrane result in this uh, level of amplification. So the, uh, the measurements of the turbulent kinetic energy show that there is amplification, uh, but the exact mechanism, how this amplification happens, we're still trying to figure out. Thank you. I have a question, Cha. Yes, Pala. Um, Varghis, I have a, a question, not a fluid mechanical question, just a general knowledge question. Um, uh, when you have uh, a tidal flow or a uh, river flow coming, um, when, when, when you channel the flow um, and then you put a turbine, um, the blade sort of cover the entire flow cross section, or you can make the blade cover the entire flow cross section. So the entire cross sectional kinetic energy can be used to extract at least a portion of it. Um, in comparison, this, this uh, sort of like oscillatory one uh, that you were talking about, the, the blade just seems to see only a small section of the flow, okay? Um, so um, I was concerned about uh, uh, um, its overall efficiency uh, uh, in that manner. So that's why uh, I want to know why one would uh, uh, use that. Uh, um, of course, this has nothing to do with your uh, uh, what you have studied uh, with respect to deformable membrane, but I, I was just curious and I wanted to hear your take on it. Yeah, so, so th this is a very good question. Uh, and I did not present the full story here. Uh, so if you want to use it on a farm scale installation, uh, you, you, you cannot sustain it with a single foil. Uh, but you basically use concepts like uh, tandem foils or cascade of these foils. And one of the benefits with this oscillating foil is that the foil that's uh, cascaded or upstream is not really influenced too much by the, uh, the, the, the foil that's below it. And that's just one end of the story. You can also, uh, so if you, if you were to put a cascade, you'd definitely uh, get a multiplication of this power, uh, maybe not a linear multiplication, but uh, you still uh, benefit a lot. Uh, in addition to that, you have these unsteady motions creating these leading edge vortices and they detach. So if you can place uh, foils uh, in tandem behind them so that they uh, are out of phase and they, um, uh, they collect these uh, rotating vortices on top of them, then you can further enhance this. So, um, so in principle, you could say that you can exceed this Betts efficiency limit, which is based on an infinite number of blades in a steady incoming flow and a steady outgoing flow. Okay. Thank you. That's what I thought maybe something people may be doing. Thank you. Yeah. So more questions from audience. I have a quick question here. Um, okay. Yeah, great. Very nice to see everybody. Uh, so uh, very nice talk. So I really enjoyed this. Um, I have a quick question regarding the 
the drag uh, enhancement for the first part of your talk. Uh, based on your model prediction, uh, is there a limit to how much the drag can be increased? Um, and can you just keep reducing the uh, modulus and to make it more deformable to increase this drag you know, continuously? Yeah, so th th this, this is a very interesting question. In initially, we also had this thought that we can keep deforming it. Of course, the, uh, the model that we use will break down after a deformation of one radius. Uh, but turns out that if you deform more than a hemisphere, the rigid shapes drag itself starts to slowly decline. Uh, so um, uh, there's more flow turning, but I, I suppose the back pressure um, catches up so that the uh, total drag is actually reduced. Um, so uh, we cannot deform further and increase the drag. Uh, but at the same time, if you were to make it soft, if you were to get the sweet spot of this resonance and trigger even more intense fluctuation oscillations of the membrane, possibly you can increase the drag. All right, thank you, that makes sense. So Varghese, can I ask a question? Yes. Okay. Very nice talk, by the way. And uh, well, I, um, if I understand correctly, uh, if you put this membrane that vibrates into the flow, what happens is that you have some energy of the flow that goes towards the membrane, then the membrane is deformed, then the stresses go inside the membrane, they deform the membrane again, they consume some energy, and then they re-deliver the energy to the, to the flow. This, uh, the total amount of energy which is uh, uh, inside the membrane, you said it's one or two percent more or less, but the effect on the, uh, on the turbulent kinetic energy afterwards is huge. Now, uh, did you try also to do the um, turbulent kinetic energy equations which include uh, the presence of the energy which is going into the surface tension, say, of the membrane, so to compute how much of the energy is actually inside? Uh, the, the the membrane right so the stored energy of the membrane uh, what you could think of is that if you if once you uh, so initially of course when it has to deform uh, it has to um, take up this as a strain energy into the material but once you are in this stabilized shape state over which you are oscillating then you are not doing any extra work to keep it there Yes, but so maybe I, you are absorbing energy at some frequency or at some place and re-delivering at some other frequency or place. Right, it, it, it could be the case, but uh, these, are, these materials are not uh, so viscoelastic also, so they do not, um, uh, their oscillations do not really dissipate a lot of energy. Uh, so all the energy, most of the energy dissipated has got to be in the fluid. Um, so I, I don't exactly understand how um, in once it's in the deformed state, uh, the extra work that's done um, could be anything other than the uh, small amplitude oscillations, which do consume the energy. So that we, we, we still don't know how it's transferring to the, uh, to the, to the flow. Okay. Okay, do we have more questions? If not, let me ask one. Okay, so I've been, I've been thinking how to make uh, soft particles. Is that possible to use your membrane to make some kind of hollow particles? Then we can, uh, the deformability of the particles can be controlled in this way. Uh, yes, in principle it can be, but it's not, um as easy as the experiment that we showed. Uh, you could make some masks or, or some stencils and uh, uh, pour them and also rotate them and you can form a very thin film. But uh, we've actually tried this, not for this purpose, but uh, for a settling experiment where you, you settle these deformable materials and then they take a new kind mm -hmm. of shape. Um, it, it, the, 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 the ridges were always uh, uh, imperfect. Uh, that's what we noticed. Okay, okay, thank you. Do you have more questions? If it's not the case, let's thank the, the, the speaker again, for this, for this very, very beautiful talk.